keep them in mind. While they're making their way back, let's take our Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, last week we went through a fairly extensive list about a lot of stuff, and a lot of this stuff was all, um, if I could say it this way, it was bad things. I mean, these are all about the very, very negative things, and what he's telling us here is how bad it is, and it's one of those things that um, you, you find out some bad news, and there's more bad news, and this just kind of keep, keeps building bad news, and what he's telling them is that context, that the time that you're in is going to be filled with all sorts of bad news, people of a certain way, uh, which is every type of way besides the truth. And so, and this is what he's addressing here. And so we saw that starting in verse number two and going down all the way to verse number four, the main problem, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now, uh, what I want to make reference to when we look at verse number, uh, verse number five, talking about having a form of godliness, we look at it in the worldly context in regards to that the world would promote a spiritual idea about a lot of stuff. And uh, it's funny because I'll talk to, well, maybe not funny. It's, in fact, it's not funny at all. But, um, but I'll talk to a lot of people, and uh, I'll ask them about, about their salvation. I'll ask them about their, their, why they're going to heaven. And, and uh, I'm more and more, I, and, this is, and maybe, maybe some of the other soul winners can attest to this as well, more and more people are saying they will go to heaven. Does that, that seem right to you? I mean, I, I've noticed that. Honestly, starting now, almost like everybody, like, oh, I don't know. I don't think you can know, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't go. I hope so. But, like, increasingly, people are like, yeah, I'm going. I'm, I'm going. And uh, it doesn't matter what's going on in their life. I'm going. And they're so confident. Listen, I'm, I want people to be confident. I hope if you attend Charity Baptist Church, you're confident you're going to heaven. But I hope, I mean, I sincerely hope because it's necessary you know this, that it's not because you're a good person or because you've earned it in any way, but because, because we know that Jesus Christ himself has bought that for you and given to you eternal life by the blood that he shed for you and his resurrection. That's the only way. That's the only way. So we can say confidently, we're going to heaven. But increasingly, I'm meeting people that have that, they don't have a confidence in God. They don't have a confidence in Christ, not in their church, not in even spiritual things at all, just kind of themselves. But I'll also hear this, that in that spiritual idea, it's like, well, I'm a spiritual person. People will call themselves spiritual persons, whether or not they even believe in God. People are searching spiritual circumstances. They want spiritual experiences, and that really doesn't mean much anymore. But in this, there is a practical point that within our churches as well, that he's addressing that um, there, within our interactions with our churches, both in and outside our churches, we can have people like verse 5 that have a form of godliness. And perhaps it's not that it's spiritual in the weirdest ways. Uh, for instance, um, in, in Hinduism is, is rather popular in pop culture. They just don't even realize it. But, but that is very, very popular. And uh, a lot of like the inner workings of like the spirit and what they think is spiritual is actually just a reshaped form of Hinduism. And so anyways, uh, with that, these spiritist ideas on, on those things, that's a, that's a weird thing. But within our own churches, we have things that look spiritual, like they look like what we would preach and what we would talk about, uh, down to the way we dress or the Bibles we carry. They have a form of godliness denying the power they're with. This is the core of the problem. It has to do with the rejection of God himself, specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this is what he's talking about. The admonition in verse number five, it says uh, at the end of it, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And so the concept here would mean that within the purity of what the gospel is, we need to make sure we're staying away from those things that are not. Uh, those things that are not that and may look the same, may even, may even look the same in almost every single way. In fact, you'll find people that have higher standards. If we can use that term. I don't think the word higher standard is fair, but, but you understand what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's more rules than, than maybe you have. And with that, we say, ah, they're more spiritual because they do that. They do those things. Um, I've known people that would refuse medication because they would say that's not relying on God. Now, is that a higher standard or maybe it's a not wise. And so even Timothy is told a little wine for thy stomach's sake, you know, as far as the idea of a medical idea, ointments and apothecaries are, script, are mentioned in scriptures and being taken for different reasons. And so anyways, with that, the Bible talks about um, the, the fact that we need to stay away from those things that would pervert or get away from the gospel of the truth. And so in this, um, he does, and I'm just kind of picking up where I, I didn't finish my message from last week in verse number six. He says, uh, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Now, I won't get too much into this, except to say 
that it gives the idea of how this is going to take place. For one, there's an influence on women themselves. Um, there, there's much to be said with that in regards to the deception aspect of it. You'll find one of the things you'll find uh, largely with cults is just how strong, strongly women will be involved in them. So, for instance, you would have like Charles Manson, uh, which many of you have no idea who that is because that was like way long ago for some of you. And, uh, and, and anyways, with that, but you have people that followed him and largely just huge numbers of women that would, would follow him. You might think, why? how would anybody believe that guy? Well, because he crept in and led them away. And so, and by the way, if they crept in, what did they creep into? Isn't that something we have to ask? Are they creeping into the world? No, they're already there. Where they're creeping in is into our homes. And it's going to our places. And it's sad when we're opening the, the floodgates of the stuff to creep, where they don't even have to creep in. We, we invite them in to walk and run into leading our own children away. And this is the idea. And so he's telling them here that when it comes to this, these other false doctrines that are present out there and those people that are advocating these things, the spirit of this age, which is very much a love of self and our doctrines and our ideas, that this is something that's being, uh, that's being bred within our churches because we're allowing it to creep in. And, and it's one of those things that we're seeing in empowerment. And listen, we, we, um, we need to be very clear that the, the feminist movement is not a godly movement. Uh, I'm not suggesting at all that women are not important, okay? Some people are like, ah, you're anti-feminist, you hate women. No, that's not at all. The feminist movement is a specific political movement that has an idea of empowering women in such a way that is not godly. It's not proper, it's not, it's not biblical. And so when we t look at the value of women and the, the, the role that they play within Scripture and in Christianity, it's incredibly valuable. But unfortunately, we're leading them in such a way that it's all about the woman. And do you realize that when it comes to the men, it's not all about the man? And that creates problems for men as well. But we've, we've take, taken such a, a, a turn and we've, we've made it so extreme about making it all about the woman. And what he says is that silly women will be led captive. And here's the idea. When it comes to these like feminist movements and this idea of, of these, uh, these empowering where you're such a strong woman because you can come up with those, all these ideas and you can take a hold of your life and you can change everything about you and, and the world and, and you can do it. You don't need a man. Do you realize that by definition of what he's telling you, that is the spirit of the age and you're a silly woman for believing it. Now, that sounds kind of mean. It's Bible. All right, this is what he's talked about, um, which is interesting that he would use the word silly women because it's exactly what people are trying to get away from. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's vile. I think it's ridiculous when you have campaigns. For instance, Hillary Clinton was running against uh, President Trump um, or uh, candidate Trump, I guess, during that time, and would mock women talking about how it hurts the cause that women desire to stay home and work. And so because, I'm sorry, stay home and work in their homes as far as taking care of their households instead of joining the workforce, that that was somehow hurting the cause of women because a woman wanted to stay home and take care of her kids in her home. And uh, anyways, uh, the idea that we are only satisfied when we finally ascend to a certain role in society as far as what the, um, the view is, uh, as far as what, what uh, people think would make them valuable, the Bible is describing it as, as, uh, as silly women that would fall into that. Uh, now, in that, um, notice how it's done. Now, this is not only going to be women here, but in verse number 7, it tells us how this is going to happen. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We live in an age of knowledge, don't we? And it's remarkable how dumb people are. <laughs> and, uh, and I say that tongue-in-cheek. I'm not just trying to insult people. But the idea is we live in such a time where there is just an unlimited amount of knowledge out there. And yet you can go out and talk to random people who don't know basic things, but you can't. And, and so I've seen a number of, of things where people go out and interview people and ask them basic questions like of our country. Now, we live in a society where all this information is there. We are giving people like children, computers and tablets and all that in the schools. Uh, we were in Alabama and all of the students in Alabama in our, in our public school system where we were at, all of them, all of them down to the little levels got MacBooks or iPads. Now, all of them, because that's what they needed, right? And, um, and so anyways, it was given to them, and grades plummeted with all this information. Uh, people started testing poorly, and they said, oh, but some other people did well. Yeah, but they were going to do well anyways. And so the, the point is that we have all this information, and they don't do better for it. But we're ever learning, and we're not capable of coming to the truth because we just learned other stuff. And things that are not truth-oriented are then to the forefront, and that's unfortunately what's causing many, many problems, ever learning. 
but we're not capturing what's absolutely necessary, and we're being led away with that. And it's interesting, just this, this constant push for learning, for learning, for learning, and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't learn. I think it's really sad when you have a, uh, an environment amongst Christianity that Christians are perceived as ignorant and unlearned, not for the same reason that Peter was, that he didn't have an education, but because we are literally unwilling to learn. All right, we're very, very ignorant about it. Many of the doctrines of the scriptures, we will stand by them, we will preach them, and oftentimes not knowing what the Bible says. You need to learn what the Bible says. That's why Timothy is told, study to show thyself a privilege to God. Didn't he say that in the previous chapter, verse 15? Study to show thyself a privilege to God. So it's important to study. We're not supposed to be unlearned people. But when it comes to that, we have to remember something, that there's a point of ever learning just about everything that's not profitable, and yet it's going to be avoiding, it's an aversion specifically to the truth. Um, now, in verse number eight, he's going to talk about two people that I don't know much about. And let me, there's a lot of stories. People give exact explanations as far as who it is. But in verse number eight, now is Janus and Jambres withstood who? Moses. Now, Janus and Jambres automatically were like, aha, these are the magicians. And uh, if, if you watch movies like, um, like The Prince of Egypt or... Um, I think even the Ten Commandments, you have where, where uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he's got his magicians, there's the sorcerers, these two guys that are against him. Uh, and, and frequently that's Janus and Jambres. But do you realize the Bible doesn't say that? Uh, and so the, the concept here is we make an assumption. But the point is that there's people that withstood Moses. Now, when they withstood Moses, who was it? Based on what he's telling us, I really believe that Moses was not just withstood by the magicians. Well, duh, they, they were against Moses. Moses went in there knowing that the magicians and these people that worship their priests for these other idols, that no doubt they were going to resist them. I tend to believe Janus and Jambres were other Israelites. I, I really believe that. Uh, because when they went in there, it wasn't just Egyptians that were against Moses. A lot of them questioned Moses, who are you? to do this. And there's question, there's, there's some resistance there, but the Bible doesn't give us specifically who these were. And the point is that they were resisting them. So maybe there was other Israelites, maybe it was Egyptians, maybe it was the two priests to these other gods. We don't know, but the point is that there was a resistance and the resistance specifically was to truth. He says, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. So, he talks about Janus and Jambres opposing Moses. By the way, one of the ideas on this uh, withstood Moses, um, one of the possibilities on Janus and Jambres as well, which I, I don't believe so, so I'm just giving you my speculation here, is that they withstood the law of Moses, and so they're current to Timothy. In other words, they knew about Janus and Jambres, who withstood the law of Moses, possibility, but I do tend to believe that they actually had a contest with Moses at some point. Now, in this, what he describes in their opposition to truth, he mentions the word reprobate, and he says that they are reprobate concerning the faith specifically. Now, now reprobate's an interesting word because it has the idea of not just defiled, but literally something that is rejected. In other words, this is something that's not acceptable. And very specifically, he's talking about that in regards to the faith. What this means is maybe you could look at Janus and Jambres and say, aha, well, look at the way that they're living. Isn't that wonderful? Boy, they're good neighbors. They're doing good things. They're doing wonderful. But he still, still, still explains something very clear, that they're reprobate concerning the faith. And it's something very specific. This is not accepted of God. It doesn't matter what else is in their life. Because of the fact that they're reprobate regarding truth, that's something that's rejected. And so when he tells them that, he explains that they will proceed no further. They will never get beyond whatever's able to be offered. That, that's it. That, what, whatever. So you think about any false cult, any religion that gets you out there to change your behavior that seems good, maybe gets you political points, maybe gets you social points. We're, we're living in a larger city, so there's not like one church in town that people are like, oh, yeah, that's the church to go to. I mean, there's a little bit of that. But, but, uh, but especially in smaller towns, how many of you have lived in smaller towns before? And all right, we keep those hands raised. If you lived in a smaller town, how many of you had the church in town? The church in town. All right, so you, you know what it's like, right? You go to that church, and the politicians in that little town, they go to that church. The used car salesman, which I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean to used car salespeople, uh, but the used car salespeople go to that church, right? That's how you know where the power is, where the used car salespeople go. And so, anyways, when they, when they go, so you have this, um, no, no slam, Matt, I promise. All right, so the, the point is, when we, get to, um, when we get to this idea here, is that people are going to that, and they think it, it looks wonderful, looks powerful, and it looks right, but it's not truth-oriented. 
It's not truth oriented. And so even if it looks right, the point here is still when it comes to the truth is something rejected. And so they proceed no further. Their folly shall be manifest unto all men. The point is that there's a judgment that's going to be demonstrated, that God himself will demonstrate the fact that this is something that's not worth it. Now, all of that, this is my pickup from the last week's message, okay? So this is just a lot of stuff to throw in there. Um, what do we do with this? Okay, we live in a society that it, this abounds, doesn't it? I mean, there's like tons of problems with this. It's just absolutely everywhere. Um, the, the idea of just constantly pushing uh, this, this, uh, this, this self-love. And I'm not saying that you should have a self-loathing. You know, the Bible talks about no man, yet ever, no man uh, ever hateth himself. You shouldn't hate yourself. And I think the self-loathing obviously is a problem. But the concept here is we have such a push at a love for ourselves over a love of God. And it continues to increase and it waxes worse and worse. People don't want to listen to truth. People do everything they can to get to truth. I mean, to, um, to, to avoid truth. Just think about society. We try to fix everything we can with any possibility of change besides going back to God. From schools, and, and I'll be honest, we, we live in a very diverse society. I don't necessarily want every form of religion being, being um, what, what's leading in prayer for my children, Right. So, so with that, I, I understand the aversion, but at the same time, it was also something very clear that it wasn't necessarily a prayer in general of praying to any God, but a prayer to God himself, something that we removed from schools. Uh, we didn't remove holy books from schools. We removed the Bible from schools. So you can still find Korans in there. And then, then if you do study the Bible, it's usually just in a snippet, and it's going to be a critique, and it's purely academic. But the Bible itself is something that would sit on a teacher's desk. It's something that you don't find much anymore. And so the goal was to remove scriptures from schools. And with all the problems that have continued since that time, have things gotten better during that time? No, absolutely not. And we're like, well, we need to fix it. What do we need to do? More like that. And the problems get worse. Like, why is it that the further we get away from the things of God, the schools get worse? Well, no doubt. We know the answer, but still we'll try to seek after something else. And I want to remind you when it comes to that, the people that are living this way and encouraging these, these things to separate themselves far from God, that is their heart to do so, and they do not see that the truth would set them free. They don't see it. It's not present in their minds. And so, anyways, what he's going to tell us here is that there is a way to then survive these last days, surviving these last days, when specifically it's by thriving in the Word of God. Now, how are we going to do this? Number one is going to be with godly example. Verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. It says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, Purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now, he says that you've seen me go through all these things. Now, in this, he starts off with my doctrine. Now, this is, this is what I've taught, in other words. When you look at this passage of Scripture, he's telling them, Timothy, you have followed me. In fact, if you'll notice down in verse number, uh, verse number 11, he mentions three cities there. You have Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. This is within the region of Galatia, which, by the way, is where Timothy is from. We know from the Bible that Timothy was frequently with Paul. It's very likely, and based on the way he's writing this, he's saying, you were with me, and you saw these things in me. And so, with this, I want to encourage you about something. When it comes to surviving, as far as doing right, doing well, not giving up, one of the most important things is godly examples. I want to speak first off in regards to church. It's vital that you go to church. Now, we, we, can, um, we can make a lot of cases. A lot of people say, well, there's not a verse in the Bible that says go to church. In fact, even Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, doesn't give a, a, a commandment of go to church. It basically says when the church meets together, make sure that's a priority. That, that's, uh, don't forsake it, right? This, as far as not making it a low priority, make sure you're going. But, but besides that, there's not like a passage in the New Testament, which is the church attendance passage, which you would think it would be, right? But here's what you find. Go through the book of Acts, and uh, what you find is while they're waiting there in Jerusalem, you have a group of people waiting in the upper room, and they're waiting specifically for the Holy Ghost to come upon them, and then they will receive power to preach, right? They're going to go do what they need to do, be the witness. Well, once they receive that, and so there's preaching, there's 3,000 souls saved, right? Acts chapter 2. 
And a lot of people get saved, and they keep meeting. Over and over again, they're meeting. Peter gets thrown in prison. They're meeting. They're praying. Over and over again, what do you find? Chapter 2 and onward is that they met in each other's houses. They met together. Paul would go to a town, and they would meet on the first day of the week. The Bible talks about it in regards to the gathering of the finances on the first day of the week and taking up collection for the saints on the first day of the week. And, and so they're meeting together. And so here's the thing. It's not necessarily a chapter of go to church, but what you'll find consistently throughout the entire New Testament is that the church meets together. That's the practice. And it's interesting because when you get to this idea in regards to Christianity, when you get saved, you get baptized, there is that compulsion about regathering together with other saints because that's what Christians do. In fact, the term church, which is our defining mark, we are the church, doesn't have a big bearing in regards to what uh, the title of it is. Sometimes we put capital C church as far as like we are the church and have this title. But the word church, by what we're talking about, really is not defined by this big title as much as what we do because it means a gathered assembly or a, a, a called out assembly. So we've come together for something. So it's, we are, by our title even, talking about more what we do. And somebody say, well, no, well, we're all, when we're saved, we're baptized, we're in the, the greater world church of all believers. I understand that in regards to the body of Christ, who people who are saved. But when it comes to that, it is local assemblies. Have you ever gathered with the entire church of all, all saved people of all generations? No, it's not going to happen for a long time. That's when Christ gathers his church. But so, so when we think about Christ gathering, that's, that's one assembly. But you've not showed up there yet, right? And so with that, we have local assemblies. In our local assemblies, we gather together. And so knowing that we gather together, why do we gather together? Well, yes, it's for instruction. But one of the other things about it is because we do need godly examples, and there's a place we get godly examples. It's right here. And by the way, the pastor shouldn't be the only godly example. I'm not saying, like, I'm the godly example here. But it should be amongst the whole church body. And we should find this, and I love the fact that we have kids that are here, and obviously in children's church as well, and, and they should be seen from you guys that there's a godly example, and it's right here. What this means, by the way, is you shouldn't come in and try to avoid absolutely everybody. Uh, just, just to be honest, how many of you are kind of extrovert and you love just being around people a lot? You love being around people a lot? Good, right. How many of you are kind of like a little more introverted? You, you're kind of uncomfortable with a lot of people. Notice the way the hands went up, all right? Extroverted? Introverted. All right, this, it happened. And so, so it did happen. So with that kind of thing, you have that. And so you might say, well, that's not my personality. And I meet people like that, by the way. And, uh, and by the way, the really introverted, I didn't even see your hands. So, um, so anyways, the, the point on that is you may say that in your personality, you don't like to be with people. But in our gathering, here's the really good thing about it. It's not about you. I get an invitation to a, um, to a birthday party. I might show up and, uh, and we show up. It's, um, it's one of those things that I can show up and I can make a big deal about me being there. Don't, don't think of too many names, but I'm sure you've had that happen. It's like, oh, we forgot. Uh, somebody was mentioning yesterday about a, a birthday party uh, for a, a Hispanic child. Now, if you've seen Hispanic birthday parties, I mean, it's a party. And it's, uh, I mean, there's, there's, it's unbelievable. This one-year-old who has no idea what's happening. Suddenly, there's lots of people showing up who don't know her and, um, or him. And then um, they'll have a DJ there, and they're renting all these supplies. And like, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's huge. It's a huge thing. And so, uh, so they'll have that, but it's... It's about that birthday person, isn't it? That's what people are coming to celebrate, and that's what the birthday party is for in general. Um, but it's not about, about you. And so you show up, and you're like, oh, I, don't, I don't really like birthday parties. Well, you don't really have to do much. You know, It's not like we're going to have a competition as far as like who. I don't even know what the competition would be. I mean, you might have games, and little kids might play games and stuff like that, but normally you're just there. And why? Because of that person, and out of respect for that individual, you show up there because you love that kid. And we're willing to go uncomfortable and, and go to a birthday party because, you know, that kid, they're one. And if you're not there, you don't know what that's going to do to your relationship with that one-year-old child. And so we'll go there. But when you talk about Christ, God Almighty, and we think about him, we say we're going to gather about him and learn about him and be edified about him. We're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, that's it's not really my thing. Well, it wasn't about you. It's a celebration about him. And we think about worship. And, and, and Easter, for instance, Easter is the celebration of his resurrection. But his resurrection Sunday, every Sunday. That's why we meet on the first day of the week. But that's not about me. Exactly. It's not about you. It's about Christ and his resurrection. And so in that, be faithful in church. Be faithful in church. What do we teach people? What are we teaching the next generation of people when we're not faithful in our attendance? What does that teach kids? We make a priority to do everything else, every sport, every activity. Uh, somebody, I don't remember who posted this, but somebody said, uh, imagine, uh, imagine telling 
your your um, your coach that you're going to miss you're going to miss a game for church and see if they are as gracious as your pastor is when you tell them that you're going to miss a service for a sport. Right? Which one's more important? And so we have these priorities. Remember that godly example is necessary, absolutely necessary. Um, and so in this, uh, we know that uh, this godly example is going to be held in certain ways. There's nine areas basically given in this passage. One has to do uh, with doctrine. Godly example means we have to believe the right stuff. Paul says, my doctrine. In other words, what I have taught, what I have believed, this is the teaching of my life. Doctrine is vital, and you notice it's the very first thing mentioned when it comes to this example. Why? Because your doctrines will determine what you do, or at least it should. It should, unless you're violating what you believe. So the idea of what you believe is vital. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we were talking about this yesterday, maybe the night before. We were just talking about uh, early, early on in marriage. We, when I, we got married, we didn't have kids for a while, uh, seven years before our first one was born. And so anyways, we made some decisions in regards to how we conducted our life. Now, was it because there was like this rule, thou shalt not or thou shalt do these things? No, but there was principles in regards to priority in our household and things of that nature. And so we conducted ourselves based on those principles. And, and it wasn't constantly thinking, well, I need the law on this one. We know, we know the principle. And the principle gave us a set of priorities for how we would do certain things, why certain things would be important in regards to the priority with each other and spending time together and, and all the other things in regards to work and, and, uh, and the plans that we would make and, and our entertainment and all those things. There was a priority in scriptures. And it wasn't just because, like, ah, we're free. We can do anything we want. Well, no. No, there's still a set of principles according to the scriptures, and so we're going to be faithful in those things. And so, anyways, the doctrine determined what we did. And so doctrine is, sec is important. Secondly is the manner of life. This would be Christian living. When it comes to the manner of life, I, I love that statement. We don't use that very frequently. Um, the the disposition, disposition of an individual is uh, something that um, we oftentimes look at personalities. And we're like, oh, that personality is a good one or a bad one. And, the point on that is that it's, it's not a personality thing. Some of you are very, very comfortable doing certain things. If, I, if we're going to volunteer for something, you're like, yes, I, I, I want to do that, but I don't want to do that. And certain things will mention, hey, we're going to do this, and you have no interest in it. But then certain things, like, yes, I have to. I have to. I've got to do that thing. And so praise God for those things that you want to do. But when we're talking about a manner of life, we're talking about our Christian living that in all the areas in which we live, it's not because of my preferences, it's not because of what I think is important, it's because I want to be faithful to God. And so you have a manner of life. Um, in Spanish, we have something called manera de hacer. This is the manner of being, the way you are. And so as a Christian, let me ask you, is your way of being a Christian way of being? I said, well, what does that even mean? You know what it means. We're talking about your decision making. Well, your schedule, if I were to go and look at your life this week, does it look like a Christian life? Like, oh, yeah, that guy's obviously a Christian. Why? It could be a number of reasons, and this is a, a sad story, but I remember a friend of mine passed away, and uh, him and his son both were killed in a car accident. When, um, when the police and paramedics got there, they said that there was no question this guy was a Christian. We didn't ask, like, oh, no, this Christian guy. Or they, we, relationship wise, nobody knew. But they made a comment about this guy being a Christian guy. You know why? Because we got an accident. There was tracks everywhere. There was Christian music. There was CDs, Christian songs. There was Bibles in there. He said, these guys, obviously, obviously, this is what their life was about. They'll be known. If, if you were to pass away, are people going to be like, oh, I wonder. I wonder. Maybe, maybe this guy was, was what? And so there's no question what his life was about. So the manner of being, your Christian living, uh, Christian living ought to be right. Why? Because we're, we're in a place, for instance, chapter 4, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Uh, we know that in chapter number 2, in verse 2, in the things, I'm sorry, verse 1, now, um, I apologize, 3, three verse 1, know that in, um, also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. He's laying this out. We're going to be in a place like that. You don't be like that. You make it all about Christ, a Christian living. Teenagers, you ought to live for Jesus, and you ought to look like a Christian. You ought to talk like a Christian. Your life ought to be about Christianity, about Christ himself. Children, likewise, you don't have to live like the rest of the little kids that are just disobedient to parents and Honestly, frankly, very difficult for their, for their parents. You, as a Christian child, ought to live for Jesus in your submission to your home. You ought to have Christian living in your manner of life. 
Uh, number three, he says purpose. Uh, you notice that he says uh, not just the doctrine, manner of life, but purpose. This idea of purpose has the idea of goal, your bearing, or your course. In Acts chapter 27, he uses the same terminology. Um, they're sailing all the way to Rome. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close to by Crete. In other words, because of the fact that they weren't sure in regards to their course and making sure they were on the right track, they stayed close to land or, or, or they, they went to a certain place and weren't necessarily supposed to go. But the point is, when it comes to purpose, it has to do with the course. What is your course? Are you, are you wandering aimlessly? And by the way, we know what our course is. We are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are running the race that is set before us. We are laying aside any weight that's with, with, uh, that so easily beset us. We are running for Jesus. This is what our course is. And boy, we can easily get sidetracked, can't we? What happens if you just move that scope a little bit, just one degree on your rifle? Supposing you have a rifle. So if you, if you move that, just one degree, just a single degree. Can you look at the gun like, oh, yeah, that's one degree off. Just looking at it, I've never been able to. In fact, I've seen it where it's sometimes a couple degrees off. And it looks straight. Oh, yeah, that looks straight. You can look down the scope. And yeah, absolutely. But you know what you're going to find out? When that bullet flies out of that gun, or shot out of that gun, you're going to see where it lands and that it's off. If you're off just a, just a little bit, you'll land in the wrong place. The idea of purpose is you have to have a plan in what you're doing. How are you going to serve Jesus? Paul had one. Also in faith, notice the next part has to do with... Um, the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit um, that are mentioned here. He, uh, I'm on the wrong page. Okay, so on this one he talks about uh, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now those are several things that are mentioned um, in a number of passages. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, probably the most famous of those. Uh, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Kind of a similar listing. A couple other things that are not mentioned. But in Galatians chapter 5, he makes a very, very strong reference that these are the fruits of the Spirit. And so then your testimony is one that's coming out. Now, in those things, so far he's addressed certain things about the personal disposition of the individual, but now it has to do with relationship with other people. Does your life demonstrate a testimony that towards other people you have a Christian disposition? You make decisions based on Christ in the way you're treating people, long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith. The idea of faith would be like a faithfulness there um, that it's directed towards God. And so these are things, it's a certain spiritual survival demonstrated by the Spirit of God living outwardly in your life, that this is something that you're living out constantly in relationship to other people. In the next verse, verse number 11 is interesting because he says persecutions and afflictions. Persecutions and afflictions. Now he ties both of those together. Uh, persecutions would be directed from other people as the consistent thing. Affliction could be from other people, but it's bad circumstances. Uh, do you ever have days that are difficult to serve Jesus? Yeah, uh, there are those times, you know, it's interesting, which I wouldn't consider this an affliction necessarily, but, uh, but I've noticed that there's not a day in the week that the pillow's more comfortable than on what day of the week? Sunday morning. Sunday morning, it's wonderful, wonderful. I mean, that thing is flat, it won't work, or it's too strong, or too, too soft, or whatever, and suddenly Sunday morning just works. It just like takes a whole week to just finally give up and let your head rest properly and just feel so good to sleep a little extra. Now, again, it's not, I don't think it's the affliction that we're talking about, but it's interesting that sometimes it's more difficult to do certain things for the Lord. You can do certain things a million times, but you do it for Jesus, and it gets harder. And when you do these things, we understand there are afflictions. Saul talks about this. Timothy has seemingly been there. For instance, Timothy is from the region of Galatia, and Paul references those areas, so it's likely Timothy has seen him go through affliction. He's seen him go through persecutions at the hand of other people. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, given a, a synopsis of what he's gone through of the Jews, Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. It's 39 times he got whooped, whipped. Um, thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned thrice or three times. I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often. By the way, in case uh, you're wondering if it's uh, difficult to travel long distance, Paul's like journeying was part of my persecution and affliction. So kids, keep that in mind. Uh, the, the long road trips. But no, these are difficult. He's journeying. He's having to travel a lot. It took a lot of work. In perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Does it sound like he had an abundance of persecutions and afflictions? Yes, yes but he kept it the godly example. The point is that suffering will come. He endured in those areas there 
but the Lord delivered me. And Timothy can see by his life that he demonstrated a godly example. Let me encourage you, be a godly example. It could be easy to get out of the things for the Lord. It's, it can happen. I've seen it multiple times. I've seen it with many people. People just give up, and it's too hard. Don't quit. That godly example is both necessary for you to see and for it to be seen. The goal of your life is not to be seen of men, but praise God if by your life that you're living for Jesus, he would use it as a testimony for other people. These examples will help you. Number two, uh, not just by godly examples, but also by continuing what we have learned already. In verse 13, uh, by the way, verse 12 is important. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But in verse number 13, it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Do you see how verse 12 and 13 go together? All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Oh, boy, it's rough. Am I the only one? No, no it's everybody. All right, you need some encouragement. It'll get worse and worse. <laughs> that's, 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 that's how I see the progression, verse 12 and 13, right? Uh, evil men shall, and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Uh, they're deceiving and being deceived. And so it's not just opposition to you, but opposition to the people that you would influence. That means other Christians, other people you've taken under wing, other people you're encouraging in the gospel and in ministry, your own children who you're trying to bring up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You have evil men and seducers who are trying to seduce who? To draw who away? Your people, your children, your family, your friends, your spouse. You're going to see this there. And so in those things, he says, here's a way to protect him. Verse number 14, but continue. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, let's go back to the beginning of Christianity for you, okay? None of you were a Christian until you got saved. So, so let's go back to that part, right? Now, with that, if you're here and you are sure that Jesus Christ alone can save, and you put your, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, would you say amen? amen? Amen. Now, with that, is there another way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In truth, is there another way? No. And we say that confidently, no. And you're assured of this, right? That's the whole point of faith, by the way, that you place your faith, your assurance in Jesus. So if you've done so, and by the way, I'm not saying you can't doubt it. And there are people that doubt these things for a number of reasons, and the Lord will bring you back to those things. But the point is that with this, there's something you're assured of, and it's mind-boggling when somebody doesn't accept it, doesn't it? You ever share it with somebody like, oh, I don't know about that. Hey, the Bible's true. I don't know. It's written by a bunch of people. I mean, um, they, they did it to oppress a society or whatever it may be. And people are like, what are you talking about? This is the word of God. I'm assured of these things. I know for sure I'm saved. I know that Christ himself died for my sin. All my sins, all of my sins are gone. I know that he resides in me. The Holy Spirit dwells within my heart. I know the Bible is true. I know these things, and when we consider those things we're assured of, he's saying, go back to what you know. You know, we're excited about new things. We get excited learning about new things. I'll go to the scriptures, and we'll learn new things. And by the way, new things are not necessarily true. Like, so if you just came up with something that nobody else knew about, uh, then, then you've discovered something that wasn't true, because the truth has always been around. Now, it could be new to you, where you finally learned it, and that's, that's, that's fine. But if it's truth, then it's always been around, okay? So don't act like you're the discovery of this new world of the Bible, uh, and then another Bible. So avoid those. But the point on that is that there are things that if you want to continue, and you don't want to fail, you need to go back to what you do know. Practically speaking here, what this means is there's things that you've been taught, and there's been moments in your life, decisions that you've made. And Christianity is very much a decisional Christianity. Sometimes we want to hope that we're, we're kind of building slowly kind of a nutritional idea that we're, we're slowly soaking it in just over time. But when it comes to that, your, your nutrition from the Word of God is dependent upon your ability to not resist it because you can. And as God is doing these work, you have to submit to those things. And those moments of decision to the truth have been times of nourishment for you. You need to go back to those. I'm thankful for, uh, for sermon notes. I hope you'll take sermon notes. Um, I, was, I was preaching this week, and, and uh, somebody came up and told me what I preached about two years ago. And I'm like, I don't know what I preached about two years ago. And so what I preached about uh, at, at a certain place, and so they came, they said, you preach this, and this is your points. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's pretty amazing. Like, I don't ever remember preaching that message ever. And so, uh, but it was the purpose of prayer, I think is what they said it was. So, great. That's wonderful. But you know what it was? She was able to open it up, and she looked at the notes and said, this is what Pastor Leo preached two years ago. And these are the decisions I made. 
And with it, I love that I have a notebook. In fact, it's in my safe. We've got a big safe and we have a notebook. It's my notebook from when I was a teenager. It's this black notebook. We got it at, Salva at the Salvation Army. And uh, it's, it was kind of cool looking. And I wrote in like this really scrolly handwriting sermon notes. And that was my sermon notebook. It was the coolest sermon notebook ever. And so I took sermon notes in there. And so I was really excited to go back. And, like I'm going to read those great sermons of the past that I heard. I didn't understand my own notes. I'm like, I don't know what this is talking about. But one thing I did appreciate was going back and I was able to read certain truth points that I'd written down and certain decisions I'd made. You need to go back to what you were assured of. And I'm thankful. We're going to have all sorts of confusions and there's going to be things that are going to come up and ideas and all sorts of stuff that's going to try to change things. And truth seems to be transforming constantly. But we know something. God never changes. His truth never changes. So go back to what you were assured of. When did you learn it? Well, for us, it's for a different time period. You might say, well, I was just a kid back then. I want you to notice the next verse, verse 15. And that from a what? Child. Let's try that again. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. You need to go back to what you're assured of. In Timothy, that means when you were a child. If you were raised in church, praise God. Praise God for that. Not everybody was. How many of you were saved as an adult? Or teenage adults, teenagers and adults? All right, you know what that means? This is unique, by the way. You realize, well, like most churches I go to, most people were saved before, like when they were children. Most of our church was saved older. Why? I have no idea. But we know that that's just how it's happened. Now, in that, if you were raised with godly teaching, praise God for that. Maybe some of you raised your hand saying, I was saved as an adult, but I, was, I received that instruction. And we, don't we know that that instruction made us wise into salvation? In other words, perhaps it was the foundation of this is the word of God and there are things that are sin and you learn that by the Bible. And then eventually somebody was able to show you the good news about the fact that you could be saved, again, by the Bible. But you go back to those things, even if you learned it as a child. Oh, but you know, I just, it wasn't really mine then. That's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Oh, I, I want my own convictions. That's true, you should be convinced of it personally, but ought to be something that we also inherit because it's something that's been passed down. And so in these things, um, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And by the way, how much of the New Testament did Timothy have growing up? Nothing, zero. So, from the Old Testament, he was able to learn. This is not the whole point of the message, but he learned about the gospel from the Old Testament to get him into this part here. And so, so anyways, um, make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so with that, we have to go back to what we have learned, go back to those things. In the Word of God, those truths. And by the way, it's disappointing we realize something we thought we believed was not in the Bible. Those are things that we realize, oh, that's, that's not present there. Um, so go back, go, go back to Scripture, what you're, you're assured of within the Scriptures. The last part, number three, is be anchored to the Word of God. In verse number 15, this is truthfully the last point. In verse, uh, it just has five subpoints. But verse number 15 talks about the Word of God in regards to what you've learned. But then in verse number 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. And so this next part, we, we know where we've come from. So we talk about the godly example. We have that. We're, we're not an island. Praise God he gave us a church. We have godly people. And if you're struggling spiritually, make those friendships. Spend that time. Spend the money. Get somebody over your house and cook them something. It doesn't have to be amazing. It doesn't have to be flaming yawn. If you want to, you're welcome to invite us for that. But it doesn't have to be. So the point is get those people out there to get that encouragement from other godly people. Make sure you go back to what you know, what you're assured of. Even if it's all the way back to just what means you're saved. You have full salvation. But then this next part is like, well, what about all those things that we don't know what to do? He says, I got a road map for you. I've got a Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, uh, I debated on this. Do I teach a message or I preach a message in regards to the inspiration of scripture and things like that? And I won't do that. But I just want to give you this reminder. This is the word of God. When he talks about this, he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And he's saying that this is sourced in him. Now, what this means is that God's word is God's word. Now, I won't go much into the transcription of it and what that means. It doesn't mean that necessarily that they were like taken over and the, when they woke up, there was a Bible written there by some means. It, he's not talking about that. The idea here is that, that it was sourced from God. God give them, gave them words to say, but he used those individuals and their personalities and characters um, to give that word. It, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. 
And so this is God's word. This is God's word. And so in this, this is God's word. And we should realize that when it comes to his plans and his ways, he's given us a word. He's given us the Bible. Go to the Bible. It's unfortunate that we are frequently fairly lazy when it comes to looking for what we need to do. You need to know what to do, what decisions we need to make. How much have you sought God for that? Oh, I'm seeking God because of the godly examples. It's good. It's true. That's helpful. Oh, I'm seeking God because I've gone back to what I know. It's true. It's good. But there's a lot of things you still need to know. And it's in the Bible. He made the plans for you. Uh, I, I was one of these people that did not like instruction manuals for years. In fact, I still kind of struggle with them. Um, I think it's weird like when they, when they give you instructions on like Pop-Tarts and, and all sorts. You're like, how, What do you do with these things? It's like 10 different steps and stuff. Okay, so sometimes they go overboard. Um, so, so, and all the things that you're not supposed to do, like you don't, don't do this, don't, don't use it for this, but not like those silica packets that you'll get in things, not for internal use. Like I, I was never like, oh, you know what? <laughs> so um, feeling kind of moist. Let's go ahead and soak this up here. Um, so anyways, that's never been a thought in my mind. But in this, um, in this, we understand something that God does have a plan. And knowing that it's God's word, we can go confidently to address the changing worlds in a world where, where um, they will not endure sound doctrine, in a world where perilous times will come, in a world where seducers uh, and deceivers will wax worse and worse. And it may be that the world will mock the fact that you have scriptures and that you're a Bible thumper because you go back to the Bible. But here's the thing. We have a confidence that when I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to know that the Bible says this, so this is what I have to do. How, how am I going to address this? Oh, you can go back to this program and that radio program and that book and this health, help stuff and what the government says. But Christian, we have the Bible. And you go to what the Bible says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I'll say it this way. While there's a list of things about, uh, about in, uh, reproof, or doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, can I just say it this way? It's what you need. It's what you need. Oh, I, I need to know what to do. It's right there in the Bible. It's what you need. So be in it. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Why do good works matter? Because you're in a point where it's challenging. How are you going to do this? By the working of God. Perfect. Now, the idea of perfect, uh, I've, I've used the illustration of an apple before. I've had apples, and uh, we've had strawberries this year. We've had we've gotten a good uh, pound of strawberries, uh, or all this work. And so it started off like two strawberries last year, and a little bit more, and they keep I've not had any. My kids keep taking them. Um, but anyways, the, the, at least this year, the birds didn't eat them all. So I was, I was happy with that. But there's a point where uh, they will pick. And I, when I, uh, one of my daughters went out to pick a strawberry, she grabbed a strawberry. It was really red on part of it. And it was really green on the other part and white on the other part. Is that a strawberry? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It even tastes like a strawberry. But it's not quite full. It's not all the way yet. It's not perfect. Now, when it's finally turned all the way red, and since we can sit there until, it, um, until it's all the way ripened, then we can grab a perfect strawberry. But what is a perfect strawberry? I've seen strawberries. To me, like some people would say, perfect strawberry is about this big. All right, it's bright and shiny and all that. Maybe some of you would like, oh, I want it to be really sugary. Or, or maybe we want it to be kind of tart. What, see, perfect might be different according to what that strawberry is, even the type of strawberry. But the point is it's fully what it's supposed to be. And likewise, for a machine, you have a machine that does a job and maybe it's starting to make noise. It's starting to not work the way it's supposed to. We have a number of mechanics in the church, and, and most of those vehicles you work on have gotten to your shop. They've made it there, but they're not exactly the way they're supposed to be. There's things to correct them. When you fix it, does that mean the car is perfect now? No. I saw a picture of this, or I saw this video of a car this week that like, you couldn't even tell the wheels were moving. Um, the, 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 you sit in this car, it looks very uncomfortable to sit in it, but when you sit in it, um, you close the door, which, by the way, you can only open with a key fob. There's no handles or anything. It opens on its own. You sit down, and, uh, and then this handle comes out. It just like, comes out from the side and opens up, and that's your steering wheel. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. But the question is, like, my car doesn't do that. My, I mean, technically, it does the same thing. Like, I, I can get in it and I drive somewhere. Uh, but with that, it, it, they're different, right? But here's what I do need. I need it to be working. I need it to be working. And when there's limitations to that, we need to fix that. And God is saying, when it comes to what you're doing, you've got a job to do. And yes, it's hard. And Christian persecution is going to come, and it's going to be difficult. It's going to be seen in different ways. But you need the word of God to make sure you know how to be what you're supposed to be so you can be perfect. Perfect also without sin. The idea is he continues to work on you, keeps getting rid of that issue, the timing belt issue, and then and gets rid of the low oil issue, and he gets rid of all those problems and leak that's he's gonna fix it all by the word of God. 
And by the way, in this, in verse number 16 and 17, is looking future-wise. That means you don't already have all the answers. In verse number uh, 13, uh, 13, 14, and 15, this is past tense-wise. You've got the answers already, but there's more answers to be had. And so you go back to where they came from, which is scriptures again. How many of you, when you bought your vehicle, whatever, used vehicle, old vehicle, how many of you did what the readers meant, what the manual said, and read the entire manual before you used it? Yeah, I need one person. Okay. So we don't know uh, two. Okay, we got a couple people. All right, yes, uh, all 450 pages. You're like, oh, yeah, so that's, that's what I need to do. Uh, by the way, I love the number of those things where you go, like, all right, how do I fix this in the user's manual? Take it to a shop. Okay, I got that one, did exactly what it said, and it worked. Now, in those things, we have the information. Maybe you don't know it all, and uh, maybe you don't remember it all. Go back to the Bible. Go back to the Bible. And he's saying, do so. Why? Because you'll be exactly what you need to be. All right, so how do we survive this onslaught? How do we survive a government who is constantly against many of our values and encourages things into law that are quite wicked? How do, we, uh, how do we survive the onslaught of our education system and, and the promotions of advertisement and entertainment and movements and societies and pride months and all those things? The Word of God. The Word of God. So remember your godly testimony. Go back to what you're sure of in the Scriptures and keep going to the Scriptures. If you're not in the Bible daily, you're not going to be equipped with everything you need. You need to be doing devotions. You need to be reading the Bible. You need to be faithful at church and taking on those decisions that you need to take on for Jesus. All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Uh, we'll close our eyes just for a moment of, of reflection and, and some decisions here. Some of you need to make a decision when it comes to uh, your, your church attendance, your testimony at church with other believers. Perhaps they've been in your own household, your godly example. Some of you need to make a decision in regards to the example you're going to have. You need some of that example around you. you're discouraged. Maybe you want to quit. You need to take some people on. You need to move outside of your comfort zone to take on some godly examples. Um, we need to continue what we learn. Well, some of you are struggling. You need to go back to that. And very practically, some of you need to go to the Word. Start reading your Bible. Start reading your Bible, making decisions. When was the last decision you made for Jesus? I'm not asking when did you discover something new. I'm asking when was the last time you made a decision that brought you closer to Christ, that further equipped you to do something for Him? Make those decisions. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll have this time where you can make those decisions before the Lord. Our God in heaven, we thank you for the time you've given. We ask your blessing now on, on a time where we just make decisions before you, that we'd give it to you, we'd make it serious before you, uh, and Lord, that you would bless the decisions we make, that we may remember those, those times that we are assured of. Lord, that we'd go back to that assurance of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. We'll have just a time of